So let's say you want to simulate quantum systems, like the 1D simulation shown here. Well, it seems simple enough. All you need to do is solve the Schrodinger equation. But that might be a little easier said than done. Today we will discuss one of the most arcane algorithms currently in the archive, the split operator method. See, I fundamentally believe that every scientific discovery is itself an interesting story. So here's the story of one of my favorite characters, Psi. He's Greek. Psi typically represents the wave function of a quantum particle, which is a complex object and incredibly hard to interpret, so we often look instead at the wave function density Psi squared. This is interpreted as a probability density, and its peaks represent locations where particles can easily be found. Even though it's easier to physically interpret the probability density, I want to stress again here that the wave function is not a purely real object. It's complex with both real and imaginary parts. If we're going to simulate our quantum systems, we have to do something to really attack its quantum nature, and we get a hint at how to do this with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Let's pretend our quantum system has a purely real wave function that looks like a standard Gaussian. We can describe the width of this Gaussian with a standard deviation, sigma. As sigma grows, so does the Gaussian distribution. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle simply states that our knowledge of the location of our quantum particle in position space is inversely proportional to our knowledge in momentum space. That is to say, as the distribution in position space grows, the distribution in momentum space shrinks. Now, the most interesting part of this visualization is not necessarily the fact that our knowledge of the two spaces are inversely proportional but the fact that the operation that allows us to move between position and momentum space is actually a Fourier transform. Because of course it's a Fourier transform. Fourier transforms are literally everywhere. But this idea that we can transform between the two spaces with a Fourier transform is actually rather difficult to understand, and the most intuitive description I've found yet actually comes from the Heisenberg uncertainty principle like we said before. That said, I'm sure there's a more intuitive explanation via spectral methods, but I haven't yet wrapped my head around that, so that'll be covered later. For now, let's go back to the question. How do we simulate our quantum system? If we want to describe the movement of our quantum system with time, we often look to the Schrodinger equation. On the left, it tells us that our wave function changes with time, and on the right, it tells us exactly how that happens. We simply operate on the wave function with the hatted Hamiltonian. As a note, when we say operate here, we mean that we're multiplying our wave function by some transformation matrix or else performing a derivative or some other mathematical function. You've seen it all before, so don't freak out. The tricky part here is that this Hamiltonian can be split into two other operators, one for position space and another for momentum space. The position space operator has a straightforward implementation and interpretation. You simply multiply your wave function by some function in position space, and it acts as some potential well. For example, if our potential is simply x squared and looks like this, our quantum particles want to sit at the bottom of this well. If we move the trap, the particles move with it. Now, as a note, the wave function density is really wiggly in this simulation, and it's interesting to think about exactly why that is the case. But that might be the story for another day entirely, so for now, let's just say if you simulate imperfect quantum systems, you're going to get somewhat weird results, and maybe that's motivation for you guys to try implementing the split operator method on your own and giving it a shot. That said, the momentum space operator is a bit tricky to understand. However, rather than interpreting it as some sort of complicated derivative in position space, we can think of it as a simple multiplication in momentum space, p. In this example, we have an x squared in position space and a p squared in momentum space, which means that we can use the momentum space operator by multiplying by p squared in a similar way to x squared in position space. The split operator method basically says, hey, let's split these two operators up and deal with them in their respective spaces. To do this, we first make use of the fact that we are solving a differential equation with respect to time, and we assume our solution is some sort of exponential. Remember again that the i here means that the exponential is actually a bunch of sines and cosines. Here, we can simply split everything like so. However, as a note, in order to perform the multiplication with the momentum space operator, we first have to move the wave function into momentum space with the Fourier transform. Then, in order to multiply it by the position space operator, we have to do another Fourier transform to bring it back to position space. 
Also, it turns out that there's a bit of an error if we split up the system in that way. So we often instead split up the system like this, with a half step in position space, then a full step in momentum space, followed by a half step in position space again. It might be easier to see like this. We perform a half step in position space, a full step in momentum space, and then another half step in position space, and we do this every single time step. Remember here that this is basically a large operation on our wave function. This is the thing that allows us to move our simulation forward with time. If done right, we should be able to see our quantum particles sloshing about in our well, and that's a pretty good test to make sure everything works. But there's a little more to this story. See, quantum mechanics is all about energy. Sometimes we want to know the lowest energy state of our system, also sometimes called the ground state. It turns out the split operator method can find this too, simply by moving our simulation into imaginary time, which is tau equal to it. In this case, our solution turns from a bunch of sine waves into an exponential decay, and as we move our simulation forward in imaginary time, we see all of the higher energy states actually decay out until eventually our system is in the ground state where it's in the lowest energy. Running the simulation in imaginary time provides incredibly different results, but is no less important to understanding our quantum system. Now, there are some implementation details I didn't cover here. However, that can all be found on the algorithm archive, which is currently awaiting language-specific implementations of both the split operator method and energy calculations for each quantum state. So if you're up to the task, feel free to give it a shot and submit your code via pull request on GitHub. Finally, I want to thank everyone for contributing to the algorithm archive so far. You guys rock. Okay, so a lot happened since my last video, and I mean a lot, a lot. We have a new visualization library, tons of new contributions to the algorithm archive, just way too much stuff to put at the end of this video. So I thought I would spend my next video talking about literally all of these updates, everything that's been happening in the background, and explaining why it's been basically three months since my last video. So I really hope you come along for that one. Now, as a note, this method, the split operator method, is actually one of the main methods I've been using to do most of my PhD research. So I thought it might be interesting in the near-ish future to talk about some of my publications as they come out. But this is just a thought, so feel free to let me know what you think in the comment section below. As always, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. While editing this video, I noticed a few things. The first of which was obvious. I needed a haircut, so I got a haircut. The second of which was we're actually missing a large number of contributors in the contributors.md file in the main directory of the Algorithm Archive repository on GitHub. If you've submitted code to the Algorithm Archive and you haven't put your name in there, please put your name in there, otherwise I can't credit you at the end of the videos. Um, that is actually it, and I promise we'll go over more updates in the next video. For now, I just wanted to say thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time.